stuff. We're going to start in four minutes. Horse is in pretty good shape. It's very well marked. As I say every year, if you get lost, you got no one to blame but yourself. <laughs> if you don't see a ribbon after 100 yards, you've gone off course. Turn around. Uh, there should be a ribbon almost every 100 yards in the course. Thank the volunteers. Have fun. Your box of light. You want oh yeah, and uh, if you want to drop your headlamp at Fred's, the first aid station, there will be a box there. We'll bring those back here. Norm, are you ready for timing up there? No, One minute. Right to the light in the back left corner. That's <laughs> ready, set, go. Repeat your steps, and then back to me and out to the school, out to the sidewalk. You're repeating your steps again, back to me. Beautiful day. Do a sync clap just so that I can sync up these two cameras. Is that what the clipboard used to be for? Yeah, exactly. Back then. The whole Hollywood thing. Was How has running changed my life? is brought adventure into my life again. And I'm not part of team sports anymore like I was in high school or even in college. And I don't, I don't want to be a part of team sports in that there's every Wednesday night you have this or every, you know, you, you've got games on these days and things like, I love that, but running is that competitive part of me that I can now find anytime, anytime I want with anybody, anywhere, including myself. I don't have to have anybody with me. And so it's really... It's, it's, it's changed the way that I've approached how I go about my day-to-day -day life. 37. And the question starting is- Starting at 37 and it gets up to mid 50s? Yeah, and then it's back down to the 30s by closing time. So do I want to wear my running tights or do I want to wear my shorts? The running tights shorts. make my legs look way better, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> Prior to this, I'd run 10 marathons, 10 road marathons, and two 50K ultras. One was the Trap Rock 50K in Connecticut, and the other was the Big Brad's Ultra in Palinol, Maine, and that was last year. And both of them were pretty tough. Um, I've been running for 10 years back in 2007, I think it was, is when I started running, and I made a kind of challenge for myself to do 10 marathons in 10 years and I did that in less than 10 years and then um ever since then i've transitioned a lot to trail running and i've done a lot of hiking and those things and so spending a lot of time in the woods but moving up from a 50k 31 miles to 50 miles was a big step up for me look at so this is my running gear list look at how long this is for just tomorrow's race i got my watch charge it two different pairs of socks, trail shoes, road running shoes, so that if my feet get tired toward the end of the race, I got something really soft and it's not very technical. I got my gear out here. I have these. Awesome, huh? <laughs> so I'm gonna carry these on me. This is the stuff that I'm gonna put in my pack. This is what I'm carrying on me at all times in my pack. I'm gonna have chocolate covered espresso beans because this is my rocket fuel changes moods, um, my stingers. I just bought my brand new belt because I lost my other one to hold my number on, American flag. Nice. Tomorrow, I usually always wear this, but this is my dad's dog tag that he carried in uh, Vietnam. This was the one that he kept in his boots, so it's all dented and stuff. Um, he had prostate cancer, what, about seven years ago? He had prostate removed, and then last summer I came back and he went through some radiation. I started wearing it since then as a reminder of the strength that you need and then my mom is currently, she had her last chemo treatment uh, this Wednesday, so two days ago. And I asked her to send me something and she sent me, she's very religious and has a lot of faith, um, a little cross that has Philippians 4.13, which is through Christ who strengthens me, I can do all things, which is like the perfect mantra to have. And I'm gonna wear that I'm in my camelback or uh, my hydration vest, I'll have those in this pocket. So one of those kind of reminders as I'm running out there that no matter what you're going through, we had the slogan with my mom this time that um, how do you eat an elephant? And it's one bite at a time. And how do you finish 50 miler? One mile at a time, so.
I didn't train for this 50 miler this year, the last three months. I trained for this 50 miler for the last 10 years. And I didn't know that I was gonna run a 50 miler 10 years ago, but I knew that this was kind of the distance running was one of those things that really intrigued me. I got into a lot of books about mountaineering and kind of those endurance efforts where guys would go climb Mount Everest or K2 and spend two or three days in a row of climbing and really pushing the limits of you know the the altitude, what you're eating, the effort, all of those things combined. I really loved that management aspect of it. And so for me, the training for this wasn't about going out and running 100 miles a week or 50 miles a week or even, even 30 miles a week. I think my Strava told me literally the day before, it gave me my recap for October, and I'd run 47 total miles in the month prior to the 50 miler. So what we go, we gotta sign in, drop our gear off, and then run. It's a pretty simple game plan. <laughs> I'm not really nervous before these these sorts of things because the worst thing that happens is I don't finish and someone drives me back to the finish line. It's like, like what what am, what am I nervous about that day? Hey, morning. Which race? Uh, 50. 50 miler. I think it's more like eagerness to get going. Thank you. 50 miles. That's right. You heard it correct. See, VIP parking, man. The scene when you got there at the race was pretty incredible. It's pitch black. It's we got there at maybe. 5.15, 5.30 in the morning. You see everyone walking around with their headlamps on and their buff like headbands on and all these things and their cool Patagonia tech jacket and you start to get in the mood. You're like, this is this is our scene, these are our people. I've run the New York Marathon in Boston and Chicago and it's so formal, it's very, very organized and, and it's great. I mean, that's why those races are what they are. That's why they can handle 40 or 50,000 people. But when you're only doing with a couple hundred and you can kind of joke around about this day that's going to be this real battle, it's kind of funny. How are you doing? Uh, Nick Lunger? Oh, oh, really? Are you getting up to uh, I don't think so, no. Oh, Nick. Yep. Okay. There you go, sir. Good thank luck. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you. When you go and you Google big trail races like the Hard Rock in Western States, and those are obviously 100 mile races, but all of them start with this very kind of whimsical headlamps on and everyone in the dark and everything. And I've never had that before. <laughs> I've had early starts, but this one was, you know, like I said, you're standing there and like your breath is going in the headlamp and you hear the bagpipe and you're like, I feel like Braveheart right now. <laughs> it's, like, it's just great. It's <laughs> It was so informal that the race director was like, you got it? You want to like, you want to yell go? And like someone yelled like go and all of a sudden we're just like go. And go! And the only thing you hear is like the, the footsteps in the field. This big like battle cry. And then nothing, nothing for an hour of, yeah, we got like 10 more hours of this. Somehow naturally you fall into this pack of people that are about your speed and pace. And next thing you know, you're, you're running with them for two or three hours without saying a word. It's pitch black and headlamps. And all you see is the person in front of you and their feet. And you hear the people behind you once in a while, you hear someone like trip and fall, or you see them in front of you and just, everyone's like, hope oh, you okay, you were good. And then everyone gets back up and keeps moving. One of my favorite things, you go through the woods and, and all of a sudden you look up and ahead of you, the group of 15 to 20, that was, you know, a minute or two faster than you a mile, you'd see them. And it would just be this like snake going through the woods of these like headlamps. It got light probably an hour into the race, right? Light enough that everyone starts peeling off their headlamps. When the sun started to come up on the, on the first loop, you're about an hour into this race, and this is when you start to settle in. You've run four or five, six miles or whatever it was that you're covering in that first hour. And it's nice to see everything, but it's also a little bit scary because all of a sudden you're like, these are the woods and it is big and there's a lot of trails and there's a lot of, a lot of day ahead of us. Like the day just started, and I didn't think I was finishing before the sun went down. 
I got running behind this one guy for a little while and about mile six, I remember looking down because after this conversation, I noted how far we were. I looked at my watch. I started asking him, you know, have you run this race before? He's like, yeah, I ran it last year. And so it's not his first 50. He's even done this course and we're talking about it. I'm like, so what are you thinking about running today? And he's like, 930. And at this point, I'm like, oh God, I messed up. I mean, <laughs> can't help but think like, are these the people I should be running with? And some of them I was like, damn man, like I'm not running with that person because they're, <laughs> they look way too good to be running. And there's people like, how the hell are you running with me right now? I needed to do three hours a loop to hit the cutoff. I expected to do 230 to 245 and I did 214 in my first loop. And I was just like, whew, that was fast. 50 miles is a long time for a mistake to bite you back. How are we doing longer? Awesome. Let's get Nine, sub nine right now. Okay. So you feeling good? You know, you get single tracks. We've got these trains of like 15 people. It was easy to just be pushed and pulled at the uh -huh. same time. Uh huh. It's got a lot of runnable stuff. I came through, I saw Greg and Josh, and I come through, and Greg's like, all right, I'm going to come out with you. You need water or anything? No, I'm good. Is that right? Hmm. Good shot, buddy. All right, keep it up. And then we go into the woods. You go kind of down this like quick little chicane and you're down this like dirt path. There you go, yeah. You turn into the woods and it starts going uphill. It's not an uphill, uphill. Even the pace is way too fast. But it's enough that you like you're running uphill. You know it. It's it's harder, and um, we ran it. And Greg was like, "So I was gonna say now, if this was me on a 50, I'd probably be walking this, even though I know it's not much of a hill. Obviously, dude, run your race. You know, it's, and I know it's not much. It's hard because I know that this flattens out right after. Oh yeah, so you already did this. I would have walked that. <laughs> He's like, I'm not gonna tell you how to run your race, but like, and, and I love that he said that because it kind of, it told me like, you just ran a really fast one and now you're going, I'm doing this again. 20 minutes later, I started to hit my, my rough spot. 15 to 22 in the second loop was like, oof, not, not fun for me. Every once in a while I get the dry heat from running early in the morning. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Plus eating pretzels and Pringles and chips just now. And the thing that I can bank on is that between miles 15 and 22 of a long run, I'm gonna be miserable. I get the feeling I'm about to enter a dark period. <laughs> so I sign up for these, right? Oh, damn. Come on, Nick. I'm starting to really feel a little bit tired and, and I'm, I'm trying to be a little bit tougher than I should be. Cause you know, I just picked up Greg, I gotta look good. Oh, damn. You all right? Yeah. when Josh was in my house, we talked about when we thought he would catch up, we made this over under bet. And it was, we did a lot of math and it was hard to do because he's gonna run a faster pace than I was. He was starting 15 minutes later and he had to run an extra mile. Hey, how are you? You are crushing it, look good. I fell twice already. I saw a lot of that, especially in the beginning. Step it up. Hey, good luck, guys. Good luck, Josh, go get him. Go win it. Josh started to leave us and he went out ahead of us for a little while and we came around this corner up this hill and all of a sudden I see Josh just in his orange shirt and his headband waiting at the top of a hill and we get up there he's like, oh, this sucks, man. I'm like, I, running alone does suck. Trust me, I know. <laughs> Every time I do a marathon-ish distance, we marathon a 50 Yeah. at the end of it, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I came into this race being like nutrition and hydration of my thing. This is where I've done all my research. I have a very, not strict diet, but a diet that I take a lot of care into what I'm putting into my body. <laughs> the lactic acid, I think, started to build up. The race started to slow a little bit down. You settle in, the excitement's gone, and this is when you start to, you realize the things that are going wrong. I think I'm gonna start pulling it back just a little bit. Yeah, smart. It's a good time to do that. It felt like the next aid station was a million miles away. I keep telling myself, 
If you move quicker, it's over soon. Yeah. That's not necessarily true though. It was rough for me. I'm running my second loop and my stomach is really, the biggest thing is just the dry heaving. I approach the aid stations and I know I have to eat. When you have such a plan on what you're supposed to be eating and drinking and then you have to deviate from this, I'm not even halfway through a long day. I started to get a little bit worried about it. I'm starting to doubt myself. In, in any normal marathon, this is the end. Like you can, you can muscle through another four miles, no matter what, like tell me like uh, half an hour, 45 minutes, I can do that. But when I'm half an hour and 45 minutes from being halfway done, this is a, a different story. Water here, water here. Water, I got water. I get really worried about the cutoff time. The captain. Has it stretched the back for a second? It was, it was a rough lap for me. Can we get you anything? No, new legs? <laughs> yeah, we don't typically offer how about, those for how about, one more lap. How about oh. grilled, their last <laughs> grilled cheese sandwich? You gotta be no. three laps Soup? in for new legs. Right. Thank you. Larry, this cup's clean. I had made these burritos with. They were quinoa wraps with turmeric and uh, and nutritional yeast to get like blood health and vitamin B and you know all these your good proteins and complex carbohydrates and things like that. I didn't eat any of that because I couldn't. <coughs> <coughs> I didn't eat a single thing that I brought in my my grocery bag of food for myself. How do you feel? Awful. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's not helping you. That's all right, no. Running the 50 mile race for me was about putting it into achievable increments. And for me, getting to a marathon left made it very real for me. I'm gonna throw up for a second, maybe. <laughs> Yo, are you gonna bring your burrito with you? <laughs> no. <laughs> there it is. Getting through loop one was one part and getting through loop two was even even bigger part. Now I'm halfway there. <laughs> There was never this temptation to stop. <laughs> All I wanted to do was rest my legs for a few minutes and then get the hell back up and start moving. If anything, this kind of urgency to get back up and keep moving. And now I had to start my third loop and the back half, of the, I had to go another marathon and this one I was doing by myself. This was now gonna be my race. I was gonna figure out how I was gonna finish this day. You have this 200 yards to think about it and then you get in there and you go and there's, there's no other option. As much as I love the company of running and I hate going out on long runs by myself, I needed to be myself on this one. I needed to kind of recalibrate and figure out what it was that was gonna be my challenge today. And I worked my way through a lot of those issues on the third lap. If I could finish my third lap, 12 and a half more miles, I could do that. That was no problem. The end of loop three is my favorite part of the race. I came through and I come out of the woods. You're the man. You are the man. I see Stacy from across the field. I know that no matter what happens now, I only have 12 and a half more miles to go. I need to sit down for a little while. Six more miles than I've ever run before in my entire life. Hey man, best time ever. Ooh, legs are cramping, hold on. This is a long time to be running, dude, wow. There's no question that this is not where I'm stopping. I've been eating at the aid stations. Thank Good. you, Stacy. How's it feel? Uh, my stomach? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. I mean, the potatoes with salt are great. Those are just like perfect. Chips and Coke. That's my thing. Soda's been good for me. Yeah. Big scoop of tail wind, mm -hmm. you said? Mm-hmm. That's so funny because you never normally drink soda. 
Yeah. Weird things happen on the trail, Stacey. <laughs> Good time for it, I guess. <laughs> but I know also that I have three more hours of running to go, and for, for some reason this day really put in perspective that that's not that long. If I do it three, I'll finish in 10.30. I did actually. So you know what? I walked a lot more, but when I ran, I was running 10 minute miles. <sighs> One more. Again, cross the fields and go back into the woods. And this time Greg is officially with me and we're all smiles. This is, this is awesome. Josh, thanks for coming, man. Thanks for running so much. Too. Proud of you. Awesome. Having my family there, having my friends there. It was, it was like, get back and do this again. Here I was with a half marathon left and it's not even a question. And that was the thing that I'm most proud of, looking back and being like, you never wavered from finishing this race. I don't want to have a play in that game. I could break my leg and somehow I'm going to finish this race. Good job, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got it. He's going to finish. He's got it. I always think about the scene from Forrest Gump where he has all the leg braces on when he's younger and he starts to run and the guys are chasing him in the pickup truck and all of a sudden they start breaking off and then he starts running and running and running and I feel like that's that was the scene of me in my fourth loop where you start to get up and you're like oh god and you're this tin man and then all of a sudden you get a first couple of steps in and the blood starts flowing you feel good and then all of a sudden you're in a stride. Good, man. On the fourth loop my mentality was really, I broke it down into three different segments. I knew that it was aid station at 4.6 miles in, another aid station at like three and a half miles, and then 3.75 to finish. I knew that it was about an hour and 10 minutes to the first aid station, an hour to the next, and an hour home. The GPS on my watch was off. I, it died, which I was kind of proud of that my watch died before I did. One of the things that I love most about trail races is that even when it's competitive, it's not personal. It's not if you bump elbows with me or you hit my heel when we're running next to each other accidentally, I'm going to get real mad at you or, um, you know, I'm going to throw my water cup behind me and not worry about who's behind me. It's very different than that. It's a personal battle. And even though there's competitive against other people, if I beat them, they were going to be proud of me. If they beat me, I was going to shake their hand at the end and be like, yeah, that was, a, that was a great race. It's about finishing the race and feeling good about it. The aid station people are amazing. They literally make the race for you. They spend all day out there and it's, it's super fun to have those people that really love being a part of the scene. And at the end of it, on my last lap, I made it a point to like stop at all of them and thank them for what they were doing because they, they make that. like You look forward to seeing them. Three times every single lap, all day, you see them. What can I get you? Coke. Coke. The people at the aid stations always yell at me. They'd be like, get up, get up. Because like, they're afraid that once you sit down, you're not getting up. I can get us. It must be Coke, right? It looks like Coke. It is Coke. Yeah. It is Coke. Hi, puppy. I'm having a, a little glass of soda or whatever it is, and um, this golden retriever walks out from behind the aid station table and comes and literally just sits next to me. I'm going to ride this dog back. <laughs> <laughs> and then it puts his paw up. And I put my hand out and it just kind of rested in it. We held hands for a minute. I was like, are, are you an angel? So it was funny because it was like exactly what I needed at the time. And then I get up and the aid station people make Greg, my pacer, take a, take a shot at Zambuca. And Greg did it. God bless him. Thank you guys. Thank you. Take it easy. Thank you. Thank you guys for everything. You got it. We still had a lot of time left to go. And one of the guys goes, congratulations on your finish. And I was like, huh. I felt that one as soon as I left for this lap. As soon as we get into the woods, we started running. There's gonna be times when you don't have the strength to fill that moment, that you don't have something to motivate you to get through that next mile. I had carried a little cross in my hydration vest in the Ziploc bag in the front. Having it over my left chest the whole time, it was one of those things, as soon as it got hard, she had her last chemo treatment three days before that race. And I had my dad's dog tag on my, on my chest and I could hear it 
once in a while it would, it would cling against, you know, whatever my hydration vest or whatever. And those were definitely things that when you're spending 10 and a half hours of running, you look for whatever the inspiration it is that you need to go through, whether it's how you're feeling at that moment or the people that are around you. Those things were really special to have to kind of motivate you to keep going. It reminds you that this is a choice that you're making today. Everything that you're doing today is a choice. We really ran that last three and a half miles hard. I've been running for 10 hours with my stride, the same like, you know, trail running, small steps, small steps, small steps. And then finally I got to a point where I felt like you can open it up and run. I was way under my goal. I just had this wonderful moment with a golden retriever. I felt good about finishing this race. It was just a matter of what time was I gonna finish the race in now. And I knew that the faster I ran, the better chance I was gonna finish in the sunlight. The part that I think I remember the most is always the last mile because that's the one where it is the end. I always get really emotional coming to the finish line of big races whether it's my big race or running a race, someone else's first marathon, it's the final point of months of preparation. It's this amazing moment of all of this condensed into a really short period of time. And I promised myself, I was like, do not get emotional in the woods. Like, it's too soon, it's too soon. But all I could really think about was like, I, I can't, this is it. I just did this thing that I've been thinking about for so long. Hear Stacy cheering. I see her in her jacket and her boots, like way far away, and I can see the finish line. And this is when, like, your Adam's apple starts to move, and you're like, "Don't cry." This is special when Greg is filming all this. by far the fastest I'd run all day. All I wanted to do was, was finish this race. Oh yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. I didn't even look up at the time to be totally honest with you. I still can't believe that I covered 50 miles. It's surreal in that I did it, and it's not in that I've been thinking about it for so long. This was my goal. Really? <laughs> Congrats, man. Now that I ran 50 miles, it's only been two days, and I'm like, well, now I gotta run something bigger. <laughs> it's my feet, the toes are like the biggest thing right now. And general, just lack of energy, man. That is a long time to move. My goal has always been, since I got into ultra running, to, one, to run 100 miles. As I was doing the last loop, I was like, imagine, that this is your halfway point. Remember when you were at halfway and how hard that was? Like this is now, the whole race is your halfway point. And that's kind of fun.